welcome everyone to week two of February Flare Up. This year we're focusing on climate, climate change, and climate adaptation. Uh, this week is week two, we're going to be looking back to the historical. Okay, I'd like us all to take a moment to think about the places that we live, recreate, and play, whether they be seated or unseated, treaty territories, and respect where this land came from and the people who held and cared for it for a time innumerable. So Canada Wildfire is located in Edmonton, Alberta. We would like to acknowledge that this is Treaty 6 territory and we respect the histories, languages, and cultures of the First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada. As I said, today we're gonna to be looking back to the historical. We have two great speakers and an awesome moderator who's going to be handling this session. With that, I would like to hand this over to Dr. Jill Harvey, who will be our moderator. Thank you all for coming. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate this session. And uh, like Karen said, we have two fantastic presenters that are uh, going to speak to us today and teach us today a little bit more about the historical perspectives on the relationship between wildfire and climate. So today we're going to go back into time and we're going to learn about two tools and approaches um, that we can use to look at this relationship between wildfire and climate and how it shaped the different ecosystems and environments that that we uh, that we work in. Um, so we're going to in the workshop today, the plan is to begin with a look at how tree rings can be used to identify past wildfires and used also to reconstruct climate back in the scales of hundreds of years. And so really when we think about tree rings and Trisha's gonna take us through this, um, we're thinking about timescales that are shorter. We're talking about timescales that last 100, maybe 300, 400 years and over spatial scales that are a little bit more, that are smaller. Um, and the next part of the workshop, we'll go to explore how the landscape scale perspectives of how climate and wildfire have shaped ecosystems more broadly by considering paleoenvironmental perspectives. And I'm very excited to have Kendrick here to take us through um, take us through his research and his perspectives on wildfire and climate and environmental variability. For the workshop today, um, we plan to have about two 30-minute presentations, and there'll be an opportunity for questions after both the presentations. So hold on to your questions, and of course, you can put your questions into the chat box, and then I'll be very happy to um, monitor those and share those questions with our presenters after the presentations. So with further ado, I would like to get started with our first presenter, and I'm very pleased to present, um, to introduce you to Trisha Hook. Uh, Trisha Hook has been a tree ring specialist with Natural Resources Canada at Northern Forestry Centre in Edmonton for just over 25 years. So we have a real expert with us on tree rings today. Um, her research focus is dendroecology, and her one of her major research projects is really understanding the climate impacts on the productivity of both health, uh, productivity and health of both aspen and spruce. So now I'd like to turn this over to Trisha uh, to tell us a little bit more about tree rings and wildfire. Thanks, Jill, for the introduction. Um, yeah, like Jill said, I work in the climate change group at the Northern Forestry Center. And I work mainly on a project called Sypha and Cyphus. Um, this project was started in the year 2000. Um, it was in response to public and forestry concerns about dieback of, die of Aspen in the 1900s. Many years of drought led to multi-year increases in tree mortality across the region. Then after that, spruce joined the dieback across the boreal and became a concern. And we added a network of spruce to our fire monitoring network. Tree rings, fire, and climate. So just an overview and intro to tree rings, tree rings and climate, building on that tree rings, fire, scars, and climate, creating a climate and fire relationship and climate information, sources, limitations, and a summary of two major sources. So once you've gone and you've collected everything, um, tree rings are an amazing vault of information. Um, they can tell so many stories about the tree. I mean, not just measuring the size of a tree ring, but how they look, the size and shape, color of their cells and the injury response. Uh, so much information is in the tree ring record. The basic notion of tree rings is that large rings grow in years of good growing conditions with lots of moisture, long growing season, 
and narrow rings are formed when the tree is under set stress. Of course, the basic information of counting them, seeing how old the tree is and such, but measuring them gives a picture of year-to-year -year climate and also forest carbon. 50% of the carbon which a tree is stored is stored in the dry wood. So it's a really good um, measure of forest carbon. Some of the other things that we can see in the tree rings and study our drought and the lingering effects of it, forest release and dieback events. And looking at the tree ring characteristics, we can study land movement, avalanche frequency, permafrost thaw, insect activity. Um, like in these samples here, you can see I've marked a defoliation ring in Aspen. White rings are formed in severe defoliation years. Um, they're a cellulose ring. They're white, easy to discern. Um, and um, other things, there's other fields in dendrochronology such as isotope analysis, comparative wood anatomy, and blue intensity. And then for most people here, the most interesting thing is fire scars. And fire scars are formed usually when a low intensity fire wounds a tree and kills the cambium. The tree responds by flooding the area with resin or sap to protect that open wound. Then over the years, wood grows over the edges of that wound, over the edges of the scar, leaving us a dateable year. A new frontier in tree ring analysis is blue intensity. And blue intensity tends to, has shown to be a better indicator of the climate record than tree ring measurements. Um, it's, it's the amount of blue light reflected from the tree cores. And we look at maximum late wood intensity and it better correlates to year to year climate change. Um, quantitative wood anatomy, which is really labor intensive, would give us the similar information that this is a much quicker and easier method to give us really good climate information. So some of the limitations and assumptions of tree ring analysis are, a fire scar is usually only created by low intensity burns. And we need lots of samples across a region to create a fire scar network. The lack of a, a scar in a tree does not mean a fire did or not occur in the place over the life of a tree. So if a tree is standing, it may or may not have been hit by a fire in the area, or there may have been a fire in the area. So we cannot assume that a fire did or not, did or not, did or did not occur in an area from the presence or lack of presence of a scar. And one of the assumptions as well is that present day processes responsible for tree growth are the same today as they were in the past. So a fundamental thing of tree ring analysis and correlating it to climate that today, the, the climate and the conditions that produce the variation in tree rings are the same as produce the variations in tree rings in the past. So uh, fire history is written in the age of the, is written in the rings of the survivors. So pre-1880, fires were most often low intensity. High intensity stand replacing burns are not well recorded in the tree ring record. Although post-1880, we have lots of written records for many areas. So this is the principle. So um, growth patterns in the trees are unique over time. And, this is the principle of cross-dating here. Um, long histories of fire and climate relationships can then be established by using live trees and dead trees to go further back in time. By the patterns in the tree rings, we can line up histories of living and dead 
the patterns are unique. And so using those unique patterns, we can go back in time. Um, wood can be standing, dead, buried, found in lakes. On the BC coast, they have successfully made chronologies that go back 13,000 years. That is more common to only go back three or 400 years. So the more events we have, the better we can establish a reliable, long-running history. So the tree ring, the tree rings produce a signal that is of year-to-year -year climate variability. Where the sample is taken and the species can describe the temperature and conditions that the tree depend on and grow. So in one area, um, let's say Southern Alberta and the front ranges, the trees may respond, they have a different climatic driver than a spruce tree in the Northwest Territories. So by measuring the trees and um, graphing them against different climatic variables, we can see what drives the growth of those trees. This was a project it did in the Northwest Territories and in the Yukon, and it shows how clearly um, both aspen and spruce, their growth is controlled, um, was linked to a climate moisture indice. So when you find a good cor correlation, you can use that to reconstruct the climate back in time. So when we don't have a weather station, but we have tree rings, we can infer what the climate was in the past. And we can also use that to infer how the trees will grow in the future. We can also use this information when a tree, when we have these graphs and they don't line up. So if a tree did not grow as well as we would expect it, according to the climate record, we know that that tree was under a lot more stress than we expected. So a spruce tree that really grew very little in a year, we know that something else was going on in that stand. There was maybe spruce bud worm or something else. So we can filter out those conditions as well. Or it gives us insight as to insect cycles from the past. So we know, are they, were they, are they occurring more now or less now? What was the frequency, duration, and that? So going on to fire, so we go back in time, we create this great fire history. We know over the past 400 years, every 16 years there was a fire or, you know, we have every year that a fire has occurred in the region for the last 400 years. So we wanna see, we wanna figure out what exactly was going on that may have been affecting or what climate may have been driving the fires. So climate variations that affect tree growth at the local scale affect the tree rings and forest fuels. Fire scars provide the record of fire year, season, frequency, severity, and size going back centuries. So by developing a fire occurrence series and correlating it to climate information, we can help identify the climatic patterns of these occurrences. The climatic variables we often use are precipitation, um, polymer, Drought severity index, ENSO, are often compared against the fire history time series. A simple tool that, a powerful analysis that is often used to create these relationships, studies of tree ring and fire history, is the superimposed epoch. Um, I'll describe it quickly, because it really is a simple tool, a simple but powerful tool. You only need two sets of data for this. You have your uh, your climatic data, um, like I said, your precipitation, precipitation, your PDSO or whatever, and then just a list of your years of fire. Based on this analysis, it's possible to assess the influence of climatic variability on fire occurrence over the time. 
including climatic conditions during the years before the fire, during the fire, and after fires. So the, the graph on the bottom shows one year before, the year of the fire, the year after, two years after. So according to this analysis from Nevada, uh, one year before, it was slightly dry, not incredibly. The year of the fire, an index of that amount, it's going into drought. And the following year, it was slightly dry. There are some great sources of existing fire scar information. A group of scientists created, the, um, amalgamated all the known tree ring fire scars records from over 2,500 sites and more than 37,000 into one data set. This data set, unfortunately, isn't open source yet, but a lot of the information which has been published and such is available off of the NOAA website, which I provided a link there. Um, off that NOAA website, there's also um, tree ring data um, and a host of other resource data that goes across North America. It, if you haven't checked that site out, I strongly suggest you do. It's a fantastic site for resource data. So we, we have our tree rings, we have our analysis, we have, we have our fire scar information. We've spent all the time in the field collecting this information. So where do we get our climate data? Where do we get some good climate data? There are two main sources that we use. Um, they're a little bit different, but all in all, they're free. <laughs> They're both free. Um, there's Climate NA, which is the University of British Columbia and a, some other partners um, product. And then there's Biosim, which is a Natural Resources Canada product. The, um, they both are great products. They have pros and cons of each. Um, they're based, they both have a multitude of, they're based on a multitude of climate stations and providers. They provide climate data for past, future, and past, pres uh, past, and future periods. Um, you can do run GCMs on them both now. They create maps and graphs of data. There are 200 plus monthly, seasonal, and annual variables that are pre-programmed for you. Um, multiple locations can be loaded and run at once. Um, but one of the things that still isn't well accounted for and would be difficult. Our microclimates and localized weather events are not well accounted for. And uh, while weather stations collect accurate and local measurements, they are not evenly distributed and leave many empirical gaps. So, but that's not a fault of the either program, that's just a fault of the entire system across Canada. Um, Climate NA is um, a very simple program to use. It's an input output. It gives you annual seasonal monthly variables. You cannot edit which weather station it uses or correct any error. You, you don't see um, what it's using. You just get an output. Um, it uses a pre-edited pre -edited data set for a lot of its information. Um, it does give you an option to integrate directly into any of our programming. Um, there's a limited amount of predetermined variables, but there are 200 plus. And the output is a simple comma delimited file. So this is a, the input file for Climate NA. It, um, it's basic, you can enter a single location or you can upload a whole comma de delimited file of hundreds of sites for it to output at one time. It's really simple, it's quick, but it has limitations. Um, you're kind of just throwing it to the wind. It, you don't know what it's using. You don't see the weather stations. You don't have a 
control over much, but especially along the prairies, it's really good. But when you get up into hills and stuff, it's it's a little bit more difficult. I use uh, we use Biosim a little bit more, um, and it is uh, it does have a learning curve, although it's a short learning curve. It's versatile, so you can use any temporal and spatial scale hourly and onwards. Any physical or biological processes driven by weather can be defined as a math mathematical function can be modeled. For example, it, in its predefined variables, um, it didn't have SMI, so a moisture, moisture index. So my colleague mathematically put it in there and now we have SMI, which it didn't have before. It produces time series maps. And pretty much anything you want, you, it will output for you. Extreme topography is still a challenge, as in the other product. Can view and edit weather station input into models and edit out suspected data. It has a rapid weather updater application. So if you want hourly data, you can just go and click and your data is updated for you. It has added GRIBS weather data available and has more weather data sources than climate at NA for Canadian or Canada. And this is just its input and output. It outputs into an Excel type style. Um, it produces uh, maps that are not linked to GIS, but you can bring them into a GIS program. Um, this is one of my favorite features of Biosim is it, you see your weather data. And uh, for example, this one, we see that we had 16.6 .6 meters of precipitation. We know that's an error and we can see this is our map. And once we remove that error, well, our moisture map looks completely different. So it can have dramatic influences on your, your, your climate interpretations for analysis when you bring them to do relationships between your fire history and climate or any sort of tree ring analysis and climate. So it's good to check the data, there's errors that can exist and Biosim allows you to check for these and correct. And then you can also send any errors that you find back to them and they'll be removed from the weather set. Um, Biosim does have adjustments for uh, differences in elevation, latitude, longitude, and shore distance. Um, it also has a correlation for slope and aspect, and it gives you, it explains in the manual how they apply the, the factors to correct for that. Um, a new feature of 2019 is the GRIBS. Um, it gives you real world meaning, real world meaning to gridded meteorological data. <clears throat> Users who benefit most from this new data who want detailed forecasts of temperatures and winds re at real time. Um, if you want to, when you see rapid changes in wind and speed direction are important, which may be interesting to people who work with fire. Um, the data sets are made, are updated four times a day, are made available four times a day for a 48 hour forecast at a two and a half kilometer resolution. I forgot to change. So this is the um, the the resolution of the maps. Um, each of these has a bit different of a meaning. Um, the red, green, yellow, and blue. Um, but really, it gives you um, real time situations for looking back on weather and seeing the day to day hourly information. This is just some of the outputs <clears throat> you can get. So this is uh, hourly dew point 
for 2018. Um, wind speed. So you can graph you can graph it at a much finer scale. Hourly wind direction, how it changes. Um, some of the mapping features I really like. Uh, this was a rather, oops, yeah, wrong way. This was rather an interesting, just showing the the heat degree days. Um, there's the average from six, 1961 to 1990. Uh, 2002 was a, a major drought year. We see this quite dramatically in the tree ring record. <clears throat> it's a good marker year for when we're dating difficult material. There's a huge decrease in decrease in growth in trees across a lot of regions. And then in the the heat dome of 2021, you can see how the heat degree days of, with a Tmax above 30 degrees was across the province. And this is an output of biosim modeling. So we have these products, they're both great, but one of the major challenges for weather data in Canada has been, <clears throat> excuse me, the decline of stations, weather stations. So this is just a time series map over time. We have a great addition, and then we've had a great decline over the years. We have about as many, or <clears throat> we have as many stations now as we did 50 years ago, and they're continuously decreasing. So we're losing a lot of good weather data every year. And that's all. Thanks. Hi, Trisha. I'm, thank you so much. That was great. What an interesting um, introduction to how we can use tree rings and a little bit on climate, um, some of the climate data sets that are available to us. Um, I really think that tree rings are a great opportunity for us to um, get information about how frequent fires were in the past and also give us some insights into historical fire regimes. So that's really exciting. And also when we're able to build these linkages between tree ring variability and climate variability going into the past, you know, as, as old as the trees can be in some cases, four or 500, even a thousand years old, um, you're able to get some really interesting reconstructions of climate that might help to inform some of these historical fire records into the past. Um, and I did see that Karen popped in the chat. Next week, we are going to learn even more about some of these different climate data sets that are available. So that's uh, that's really great. Um, so at this point, we're going to hold off on questions just until the end of Kendrick's presentation. Um, so hang on to your questions, jot them down somewhere and or keep them in your mind. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity at the end. Um, so it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Kendrick Brown. Um, Kendrick did his PhD at the University of Victoria and worked at the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland for some time um, before joining Natural Resources Canada at Pacific Forestry Centre as a research scientist for the past 12 years. Um, and his research really focuses around looking at the origin, evolution, and landscape dynamics and ecosystems really using paleoecological approaches. So as much as Trish has taken us um, at spatial scales that are perhaps a bit finer and temporal scales that are a little bit shorter, Kendris is, is going to take us back in time. Uh, broader spatial scales, longer time scales, and with that kind of a different perspective on wildfire and climate and our environments here in Canada. So with that, I am, would like to pass it over to you, Kendrick. Thanks, Jill. Can you guys all hear and see me? Can I get a thumbs yeah. up? Yeah, wonderful. Okay. Uh, thanks, Trisha, for that uh, great presentation. I enjoyed that thoroughly. Um, before I start, I'm just going to take a quick moment to acknowledge the Coast and Strait Salish peoples on whose land I live and work um, and recognize their long connection to these lands. So today's presentation, we're gonna be looking at paleoecological perspectives. In other words, I want to show you how we go about reconstructing historic ecosystems and, and, and evaluate how they've changed through time, uh, both the vegetation as well as fire regimes in response to various drivers, including things like climate change. Um, 
And so the talk is going to follow this general outline where we'll spend a little bit of time at the beginning uh, just introducing the topic and providing you with some background information. Then we'll dive into some examples of uh, paleo uh, ecological paleo fire reconstruction. And then I want to wrap up with an example of how we are attempting to integrate paleoecology and management in a real practical sense. So what is paleoecology? Well, researchers in this discipline typically are trying to assess how ecosystems originated, how they've evolved or changed through time, and what the dynamics of those ecosystems were through time. And by, by time, you can really design your project to be you know, examining things that are, let's say, from a hundred year long time series to a thousand years to 10,000 years to millions of years. Um, we use a whole host of different types of data we use biological data, geological data, chemical data, climate data, and much more. Uh, and our projects can be very local in focus, or we can collate records to say something about regional reconstruction, national reconstruction, um, hemispheric, or even global reconstruction. And so this picture here on this slide, it's just really meant to illustrate that we can tap into a lot of different types of information and we can extract things you know, from the ocean, from the land, from flora, from fauna, and we integrate all of these different data sets. And so the, the science of, of, of paleoecology is truly interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. It's premised on using archives and proxies. So let's just quickly examine what an archive and a proxy is. So an archive is the material or the record that preserves evidence of the past. And certainly in my case, I often target these stratigraphic deposits that you see dotted across a landscape, lakes, wetlands, estuaries, and so forth. Although there's many more types of information or, or sites that we can target to extract information. And so if you've ever been swimming in a lake and your toes have dipped into the muddy lake bottom, that's the material that I often target. It is incredibly valuable material because it, keeps a diary, nature's diary, of how the landscape, how the ecosystem, how ecosystem processes have changed through time. And to get this material, you have to go out and do field work. And I often joke that one week of field work equates to about a year of lab work. This collage of photos here, can you see my mouse, Jill, if I use that as a pointer? Yes, I can. Yeah, okay. So this this collage of, of photos, it just shows our coring rig. And then the different types of cores that we use in our work. So here's a Livingston core where we take sections of mud out of the bottom of the lake. This is called a kayak core where it allows us to collect sediment from very deep water. And then we also have a Russian peat core, which is sort of a sidewall scraper, and it allows us to collect these beautiful stratigraphic sequences uh, like you can see here. And, and you know, there's dark banding and, and you could use your imagination to say, hey, maybe those are charcoal layers. I'm not saying that they are, but just for illustrative purposes. Other researchers use a whole variety of other types of information. So people work on ice cores and ice cores are very interesting because you can you can use them to reconstruct atmospheric chemistry. You can use them to reconstruct climate. You can look at how the amount of atmospheric dust has changed through times. So you can track volcanic eruptions and you can even track forest fires. So when fires burn, they loft up molecular molecules into the atmosphere like levoglucosin, galactosan, manosan, and some of these molecules rain out on the ice and they get ingrained in that record. So you can reconstruct actually hemispheric burning in ice cores. Other people use speleothems, for example, stalactites and stalagmites. These triangular shaped mineral deposits that are formed when mineral rich water sort of drips in caves and it builds up these records through time. And you can use those uh, to exact extract isotopes and reconstruct hydroclimate. Other people, as we just heard, use tree rings where you can use those to reconstruct climate dynamics or, or ecosystem processes like gap dynamics, fires, insect outbreaks. Other people use them to reconstruct stream flow, for example. In areas that are particularly dry, like the southwestern United States, researchers often target pack rat middens. So pack rats, which belong to the genus Neotoma, are notorious nest builders. So they will go out in the landscape and they will pillage it, basically, and bring back uh, 
twigs and cones and needles and bones, and they will build these nests in these rocky areas. And then they urinate and defecate over them. And they build this crystalline structure up that's stratigraphic. It builds up through time. And you can then extract that material and look at how the local ecosystem has changed through time. Uh, and then, you know, just from a marine perspective, people also in paleoecology will go out and core corals. Uh, corals are marine organisms that live in calcium carbonate shells, basically. And corals, like tree rings, lay down annual records, light and dark layers that paleoecologists can collect and analyze to reconstruct ocean pH, ocean water temperature, for example. We then bring those samples back to our labs. And, you know, in my case, we'll bring a sedimentary record like this one here. You can see this is from the Chilcotin Plateau in the interior of BC. And we will sample it down core. And basically, the deeper you go in depth, the further back you go in time. But I don't want you to, you know, worry too much when I say something's a thousand years old or 10,000 years old. The age is irrelevant. It's the fact that it did happen, it was recorded, and that you're producing quality time series that you can analyze. So something that happened 50 years ago in a record is equally as valid as something that happened 20,000 years ago, as long as the time series time series is high quality and the data that we're analyzing is high quality. So we can bring this material back and we can extract a whole host of biological, physical, and chemical proxies that are preserved in that record to reconstruct different elements of the environment, of the ecosystem, of ecosystem processes. Um, there are literally thousands to choose from, and this is just a quick picture of some of the ones we work with. Uh, I want to just quickly give you an overview of pollen analyses because I'll be talking about this and it's sort of an area that I work in. So every year, the vegetation on the landscape produces pollen. It's produced in the male cones of gymnosperms and in the stamens of angiosperms. And that pollen eventually gets mixed in the atmosphere and it rains out onto a lake. And you can see that here. So these are the pollen grains. They're raining out onto a lake. They eventually get preserved in the sediment. And this is a picture I took from Lac Santana in Romania about 20 years ago. And you can see this yellow sort of, you know, material on the surface of the lake here. This is, this is the pollen rain from the surrounding vegetation. 20 years ago, this pollen was floating on the lake. Since then, it's been incorporated into the lake sediment, and it's a snapshot of what the vegetation was like 20 years ago. Okay, so we can then come along, collect the sediment core, process the samples, analyze the samples, and then reconstruct what the vegetation was like. And from the vegetation, we can make inferences about what the climate was like if we understand sort of the climatic tolerances of the vegetation types that we're seeing. In addition to sort of qualitatively reconstructing climate, we can also collect the surface samples from many lakes and relate those to different climatic parameters and essentially develop a regression equation that relates some pollen types to some climate feature and, and then apply that regression equation to the fossil data in a core and more quantitatively reconstruct climate. So these are known as transfer functions. In terms of paleo fire reconstruction, it is very similar to pollen, except that with pollen, you have annual inputs of the pollen coming in, right? Whereas with fire, it's going to be much more episodic. You'll have a layer of charcoal that enters a basin when there's a fire, and then you'll have a series of years without fire, followed by another layer or pulse of charcoal associated with some, you know, burn years later. So if you think of combustion as being the process in which a fuel is heated, ignited, and burned. What happens in that heating phase is that you create a pyrolytic uh, charring front. Cellulose will char at, it'll begin to char at about 250 degrees Celsius. Lignin will char between 280 and 500 degrees Celsius. And some of this charred material gets lofted into the atmosphere uh, with the convective plume and it will rain out into the lakes around that fire and form a record. So we can come along and we can collect a core, we can process that for its charcoal signal and reconstruct the incidence of fire. 
And here's just a Petri dish with one sample and we'll systematically work our way through this, looking at it under a microscope, counting all the charcoal fragments. And here's just a piece of charcoal, black opaque cellular structure, metallic uh, looking sort of um, brittle. You know, there's a few other features that we use. And then just here's a snapshot of a computer screen where we're tabulating the length width uh, characteristics and the number of charcoal fragments that we're encountering. And in addition to using charcoal, we can also extract uh, molecular markers of biomass burning like levoglucosan and its isomers galactosan and manosan. Uh, and, and, and indeed, I'm, I'm working on some of these types of things as well. In an effort, really, I kind of view this as an opportunity to reconstruct paleo smoke. And so I'm working on, on compiling records of levoglucosan and these other indicators from the Yukon through British Columbia. Um, so that's kind of a, a quick overview. When we, when paleo fire research really started to take off, you know, in the last number of decades, it really was, is there charcoal or not charcoal? And does that tell us if there was some fire or, 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 you know, less fire? Um, but the field has really evolved through time. And now, you know, we're able to actually make statements about fire frequency and return intervals. So this is a plot here showing this is us today, zero. So we live here going back almost 10,000 years. Here's a raw charcoal time series that we've compiled through our analyses under the microscope. And basically what we do is we can apply a smoothing algorithm to that charcoal time series to divide it into what's known as a peak and a background component. The background component shown by this gray line just represents the overall sort of long-term, low frequency background production of charcoal, the transport of charcoal, the reworking of charcoal. And some people suggest that it could actually reflect the regional burning signal. If you subtract that background signal from the raw time series, you're left with a high frequency residual component, which can be analyzed further to say, okay, which peaks are large enough to be classified as an individual fire event, which are shown here by these plus marks. And because we radiocarbon date these cores, we can then, and we convert, essentially we convert depth to age through radiocarbon dating, we can then start saying, okay, how much time existed between these charcoal peaks? And once you do that, you can start making comments about fire return intervals and frequency. We're also making inroads into assessing what actually did indeed burn through time. And this is being done through the development of modern reference collections where people are burning material and then they're characterizing the charred material and we're comparing you know, the modern samples to what we're seeing in our fossil samples. And so in panels A through C here, this is all grass charcoal. You can see the stemata here in this cell. They're well uh, illustrated as well as sort of the cellular structure showing rectangular cells occurring in parallel rows as you would expect in grasses. Whereas in panels D and E, you can see we're seeing bordered pits. And so this is telling us that, you know, and bordered pits are important in fluid transport in, in woody plants. And so you, you can see that we're dealing with some arboreal derived charcoal here. Uh, F and G, you can see they have these sort of veiny like structures. These are deciduous leaf. And then H doesn't show any sort of anatomical features. It's just uh, more sort of uh, shiny uh, and, and lacking features. It's, it's related to the burning of resin and pitch and wax and these sorts of things. In addition to characterizing charcoal and hence fuels this way, people are also looking at the length with the ratios of charcoal. And what we're learning is that grass charcoal is typically very long and narrow. It has a length width ratio that's typically greater than three, whereas wood and shrub charcoal is more blocky. Uh, typically things that are less than two and a half in terms of length width ratio could be classified as tree or shrub derived charcoal. We're also making inroads into understanding how fire severity has changed through time. And to do this, we're working with delta N15. So that's a ratio of stable isotope nitrogen 15 to stable isotope nitrogen 14. In a fire, because nitrogen 14 is lighter, it's preferentially lost. And so post-fire, especially if you have a severe fire, you'll get enrichment in delta N15. Magnetic susceptibility. Fires can induce magnetism by converting sort of these paramagnetic minerals into, you know, um, fer fer str strong oxidized ferrimagnetic minerals. Uh, so it's called magnetic enhancement. And in addition to that process, of course, fires can consume forest floors, expose mineral soil, 
And some of that mineral soil is going to be magnetic. Post-fire erosion will then deliver this magnetic material to a basin. We can measure it with magnetic susceptibility where we apply a magnetic field to the sediment core and we look at the response of the material. Material that's more magnetic will have a greater response and we can reconstruct magnetic susceptibility. So the combination of these two, the Delta N15 and the magnetic susceptibility is being used to assess fire severity through time. So high severity fires will show strong positive signal and lower severity fires, the signals will be somewhat more mooted. So now I just wanna turn and show you some examples. Some of you may be familiar with Dyke's work from the Geological Survey of Canada, but this was a great paper he published in 2005. And basically what he did is he went around North America and he compiled all of the available pollen records, uh, macrofossil records, midden records that he could get. And he, he then said, okay, let's look at that and just sort of broadly map how biomes have changed through time. So I wanna just take a couple quick snapshots here and take you through um, uh, how the Canadian landscape and the North American landscape uh, has, has changed through time. So up in the corner here, we have calendar years from 21,000 to 17,000 years ago. And at that time, you can see that most of Canada was covered in ice. We had the Laurentide ice sheet in the west and the Cadillaran ice sheet, or sorry, the Laurentide ice sheet in the east, the Cadillaran ice sheet in the west. These ice sheets were two to three kilometers thick. Um, you can see, as evidenced by the color, that the vegetation was located to the south of the ice, uh, also up in Beringia and um, Asia, and then, you know, scattered refugia along the coasts and in some of the sort of southern ice margins. And if you work in any particular biome here, here are the names. So the purples are sort of herb and shrub tundra, uh, coastal temperate forest and orange, subalpine forest and sort of the bright green, steppe and the brownie red, grassland in the, in the brown, boreal sort of in the matte green. So you can follow you know, the evolution of your biome of interest here. Uh, another thing to note is that North America was connected to Asia because sea levels were about 120 meters lower due to all the water being locked up, not only in the Cadillar and, and Laurentide ice sheets, the Greenland ice sheet, the Scandinavian ice sheet, ice sheets in Siberia. Uh, at this time, the jet stream was deflected to the south. There was, there was anti-cyclonal circulation going on here. The jet stream was deflected to the south. And so because of that, in the southwestern United States, which today is very arid, it supported these massive pluvial lakes. So we have Lake Bonneville, which is a precursor to Great Salt Lake, Lake Missoula, Lake La Henta here in Nevada, the southern or the Central Valley of California supported, and there were many more lakes not shown on this map. And you know, just Lake Bonneville here, it's Great Salt Lake. I mean, this is almost the size of Lake Winnipeg. These were massive features. And today, you know, this entire lake, what's, what remains of it is at risk of drying out due to water diversion and, and current drought, right? So profound changes in, in landscapes. By 13,000 years ago, you can see that the ice melted a little bit and we have this, what's known as an ice-free corridor forming. This was one of the original routes that people proposed for the peopling of the Americas. This happened about 13,800 years ago. Um, one of the challenges, I guess, is that they found archaeological artifacts that predate the opening of this ice corridor. Um, so they proposed an alternative route, and that is the marine route, uh, which started to, the marine route, the coast started to deglaciate about 18,000 years ago. So it was conceivable that people came down this route. They have found archaeological artifacts along the coast here, but they, they too are sort of in the 13 to 14 thousand year range. So archaeologists are still working on this issue of the peopling of the Americas. You can see in Canada, you know, what is unglaciated is largely characterized by tundra, although the boreal forest is now starting to creep up into Manitoba and Saskatchewan and the Great Plains into Saskatchewan and Alberta. Between 13,000 and 11,000 years ago, we had sudden cooling. This is a, a, a relative sort of cold period that so we're coming out of the glaciation. We have this period known as the, the bowling alarod, a, a slight warm interval, then we plunge back into a a cold period for about a thousand years. And they think this regional cooling was related to the drainage of glacial Lake Agassiz shown here. Um, 
which delivered a whole bunch of fresh water into the North Atlantic. Fresh water is less dense than marine water. It slowed down thermal haline circulation. And because of that, we had less warm water transport from the tropics into the North Atlantic, which resulted in regional cooling. And just to give you some perspective, here's kind of just a, a quick schematic I did of sort of the total extent of Lake Glacial, Glacial Agassiz, Glacial Lake Agassiz sort of over its entire existence. You can see it was a big lake. The other thing that happened at this time is place to see megafauna went extinct. And of course, there's debate if that was due to climate and environmental change or hunting. But you have to appreciate in North America at this time, the landscape was characterized by woolly mammoths, mastodons, woolly rhinoceros, saber-toothed cats, I don't know, great giant faced bears, giant beavers, camels, horses, a whole bunch of megafauna. I think 38 megafauna genera went extinct in, in this event here. So it was a big dying. Uh, because the ice is melting, you can see sea levels are now starting to rise in North America and and Asia are no longer connected. And then, you know, between roughly 12,000, 4,000, our modern biomes more or less establish. Uh, this, is, this is kind of our maximum warm dry period. Uh, we have boreal forests spanning, you know, Alaska all the way to Newfoundland. Uh, the warm period occurred a little bit earlier in British Columbia than it did in Eastern Canada, just due to ice melt and the interplay between, I guess, ice melt and insulation. Um, in British Columbia at this time, we had maximum dry, open forest and grassland extent. And then that brings us to modern over the last 4,000 years, and you'll all recognize this sort of distribution of biomes. Um, climate is generally cooled and moistened over 4,000 years, but superimposed on that are shorter term climatic oscillations, the medieval climatic warm period where climate increased by maybe 0.2 degrees, the Little Ice Age over the last number of hundred years where climate cooled by maybe half a degree. Uh, Europeans settled in here as well at this time. Uh, and then, you know, mo most recently in the last couple hundred years, of course, we're having anthropogenic greenhouse warming. Um, these plus and minus marks just reflect the trends in charcoal records from a few sites across Western Canada. So you can see Alaska showing increasing charcoal and that's likely reflecting more fire on the landscape, even as climate cools and moistens because the, of the arrival of black spruce, which increased the forest flammability. And we also see an increase in Western Ontario. And that's probably because as climate moistened and cooled, there was a bit of a pullback from broadleaf species that had expanded a little bit north under previous warm, dry conditions. Uh, so another indicator sort of biotic uh, changes that are influencing fire regime. Whereas, you know, across um across sort of the canadian boreal from boreal from yukon to manitoba the trend in charcoal actually is one that's decreasing but you know in recent decades we're seeing an increase in area burned in canada we're seeing an increase in fire season length you know induced by global uh, uh greenhouse gas emissions and, and climate change so we're reversing this long-term trend so now I want to turn our attention to some work that I've been doing in the interior of BC. I just got to watch my time here. Um, so, and basically we've collected cores from a number of sites. So here's Vancouver for reference. We've collected two cores from in and around Kelowna, one in West Kelowna, a low elevation site, one in uh, uh, just to the east at a slightly higher elevation. And then, and then last year we collected uh, half of a core from an area just north of Kamloops. And we're going to be going out again in May of this year. So if anyone is in and around Kamloops on the call and would like to join us to see how we're coring sites, uh, please get in touch with me and we'll try and facilitate that. And, and so basically what I wanna do is just show you some of the results from our study in around Kelowna because it's very, very interesting. This is a very dry part of Canada, warm, dry part of Canada. And so this is our Shannon Lake core. It, just to give you some background, it's 500 meters above sea level. And it's located in West Kelowna, so it is a wildland urban interface core. Uh, it's surrounded by open ponderosa pine forest, as well as Douglas fir forest, Pinus ponderosa, Sudasuga menziesii. Um, and basically, what you're seeing here is a pollen diagram. And so on the y-axis, we have depth and age. On the x-axis, we have species abundance. And I just want to quickly walk you through what we're seeing here. So at the bottom most of the core, 
you can see that we have a lot of lodgepole pine pollen. So undoubtedly pine was at the site to begin with and then near the site a little bit later. But we also see abundant grass, Artemisia, and importantly, Selaginella. And all these are telling me that this was a very open, warm, dry environment. And so I'm interpreting this zone. And this is tentative. And in fact, I just produced these pollen diagrams last week. Uh, and I, I'm still digesting them and trying to understand. So my interpretations may change. I throw that caveat out there. But my initial impression is that we're seeing a hot, dry interval between 11 and 9,000 years ago, which is consistent with what we know about regional climate. And in fact, when we, so this, this picture here, it's just a field of view of, of one of the pollen slides. And you can see that it's very grainy. And that's because there was just a ton of quartz in the slides. And that tells me that it was a very arid, uh, dusty, um, you know, type conditions that prevailed there. And this, this wind blowing dust was accumulating in the lake, very hard to count. And in fact, I found this great paper by Ali written in 1976, a wonderful piece of work. And he was showing that actually in the early Holocene under warm, dry conditions, there were dune fields that were active in the Southern interior of BC. So very interesting, but hot, dry. Then what we see in the middle part of the record from about 9,000 to 5,000 years ago is ponderosa pine pollen starts to increase a little bit, but we also see that there's abundant grass and sage pollen and selaginella is still prevailing. So again, I think that it's hot, dry, but maybe as opposed to being open, it's now maybe more savanna-like with a few scattered ponderosa pine trees. And it's only at the top of the core starting about 5,000 years ago that you can see evidence for our modern ponderosa pine zone forming. We see the ponderosa pine go way up. We see our, our Douglas fir pollen increase. And so to have this arboreal expansion, it's telling me that temperature decreased and precipitation increased. Temperature decreased probably by a couple degrees, precipitation probably increased by a few hundred millimeters. And when we look at our pollen slides, there's way less quartz. So the landscape has become uh, more stable. It's more vegetated, more stable versus the early part when it was much more, I think, open and barren with sand dunes and a lot of wind blowing sediment. So what about fire? This is where things get really interesting. So if we look at the charcoal time series, and we just have to finish analyzing these last samples, but if you look at the amount of charcoal that's accumulating, in the past when it was hot and dry with an open barren landscape, you can see, you know, there's not a whole lot of charcoal. And we're analyzing this core at two millimeter resolution. It's one of the highest resolution records, I think, that's being produced globally. Um, not a lot of charcoal accumulating. Probably surface fires, maybe relatively small in size under hot, dry climatic conditions. We only start seeing a massive pulse in charcoal when climate cools and moistens, and you have a vegetation response to that change in climate. It becomes more forested and we see more, so more biomass available for burning, more charcoal. At high elevation, so this record goes back 16,000 years. This is in the montane spruce zone. In the bottom of the core, we see that pine is at or near the site, um, but we also see that there's a lot of grass and sedge and selaginella, again, implying that it's very open. We see spruce, pollen here that's probably prevailing in some of the wetter landscape settings. Um, and so I interpret this to be dry, but starting 13,000 years ago, you can see that ponderosa pine arrives and expands at this site at high elevation. It's currently a low elevation occupying species, but in the past it occupied high elevation. I think climate was very hot and dry at this time. We have these ponderosa pine type forests. Um, so the, that in, in and to itself is very interesting, uh, perhaps suggesting that ponderosa pine migrated into Canada at high montane elevations and then dropped into lower elevations when climate cooled and moistened. This zone above that ponderosa pine is, is perplexing. Lodgepole pine is clearly around the site, but you know there's not many other trees and, and the grass and sage goes down. So I'm still kind of pondering what this means, but starting about 7,000 years ago, you can see that we have arboreal expansion around the site. We start getting spruce and fir, which are associated with the Engelmann spruce subalpine fir zone and Douglas at higher elevation and, and the Douglas fir pollen associated with the interior Douglas fir at lower elevation. And again, I think it's implying that temperatures cooling and precipitation is increasing. So what about fire? Well, we finished our firework. And again, 
what you see is something absolutely remarkable. In the past, when climate was hot and dry, you can see we're seeing very little charcoal accumulating. So again, maybe spotty surface fires at best. And really what we see when climate cooled and moistened over the last 5,000 years, and you have our boreal expansion, more biomass, more charcoal. We've been able to decompose this time series and we're seeing mean fire return intervals in the last 5,000 years for the montane spruce zone of about 300 years. So now I wanna turn our attention to the Greater Victoria Water Supply Area. This is where we're, where we're um, uh, working with the Capital Regional District to uh, inform them about fi vegetation fire dynamics within, within their watersheds and fire impacts. And so basically this is a picture of the Souk Lake Reservoir. It supplies 400,000 people with drinking water that drinking water receives minimal treatment before it's distributed to consumers. It gets a little bit of UV treatment to knock out bacteria, viruses, and parasites, um, and a little bit of chloride treatment to keep the bacterial count down in the mains while it's being moved. But really, the CRD doesn't do a lot of treatment to this water because as you can see in this photo, the watershed is forested and they rely on the filtration capacity of the forests and the soils to maintain high quality drinking water. But with climate change, these forests are gonna change in character. The fire regime may change as well. And so fire, all of a sudden, when you have a forested watershed becomes a risk to water quality. So what the CRD wanted us to do was inform them about forest dynamics and fire dynamics within their catchments. And so we went about uh, doing that. And it was really a two-phased project. One was to do a long-term reconstruction. Uh, and then one was to take the fire time series, the charcoal time series that we developed and do very high resolution analyses across that to look at terrestrial and aquatic impacts that were induced by past fires. So I'm going to take you through that very quickly. So this is our pollen diagram um, uh, from present day to 14, 15,000 years ago. And I'm not going to take you through this whole thing, but just to say, here's this interval in the past from about 11,000 to 8,000 when climate was warmer and drier. Uh, we can see Douglas fir expanded. It's fire adapted with thick bark. You can see that tritium increased in abundance. It's a fire promoter, bracken fern. You can see that we have alder at a high level, early cereal species, but also that grasses had expanded um, and, and, and rosaceous type. So it's open forest with meadows, warm, dry, good evidence of lots of fire. Jumping forward, here's just another interesting interval. Climate is now cooling and moistening. And with cooling and moistening, you would expect to see less fire. But you can see in our time series, we actually see elevated fire occurring here. And this might be related to indigenous activity uh, at that time. And then the modern forest just developed about 2,000, 3,000 years ago here. Um, dry coastal western hemlock forest. Fire return intervals on the order of sort of two, 300 years, crown fires probably with intermittent surface fires. So the next thing was to say, okay, oh, I'm just gonna go back one slide here. So here we have this wonderful charcoal time series. So we chose five of these peaks, like this really big one here, which burned at a time when we're transitioning out of a cool, wet climate into a warmer, drier climate, and a number of other peaks. And then we did very high resolution analyses to assess uh, terrestrial and aquatic impacts uh, you know, that, that were generated by the fire itself. So this was a PhD project that was taken on by Nicholas Hebden. He did an absolutely wonderful job on it, defended his dissertation four or five months ago. And here we are working on one of our cores and we're slicing it with this cheese cutter into two millimeter cookies, two millimeter thick cookies, representing about four years of time. And again, we wanted to assess fire induced impacts and recoveries. He analyzed those small sediment cookies for a variety of proxies. Uh, magnetic susceptibility is an indicator of erosion, uh, isotopes for fire severity, trace elements for impact, pollen for impact, diatom for aquatic impact. And I just want to, I'm not going to take you through all five fire events, but I'm going to show you one fire event. And this is a fire that burned about 12,000 years ago. And again, we have age and then we have our different proxies that we've been measuring. And you can see here that in this zone, these proxies are all showing dramatic change. So we see increases in all these different measures of charcoal. We see an increase in our magnet or in our uh, nitrogen 15, implying a 
high severity fire, magnetics go up, telling us that there was an erosional event. You know, carbon and nitrogen go down correspondingly. The CN ratio and the delta C13 are skewing towards terrestrial type inputs. And so what we think is that there was a fire that burned 12,000 10 years ago, just based on our interpretation of these proxies. Okay, there was a severe fire. So then we wanted to say, okay, well, what was the impact of that fire? And to do that, we assessed other proxies. So these are the gray proxies that I just showed in the previous slide. And that's where we think the fire occurred. So to assess the impact of this fire on the terrestrial environment, we said, okay, are there any changes in the pollen that have occurred after this fire event? And to answer that question, Nicholas did a stratigraphically constrained cluster analysis. So basically he ran this numerical technique that looks at adjacent samples and it finds the two that are least dissimilar or alternatively most similar and it bends them. And then it, it iterates through that process and it builds up a dendrogram. And here's the dendrogram. And this dendrogram basically tells us which samples are more similar and which samples are less similar. And in this dendrogram, you can see there's a group of samples at the top that are similar. There's a group of samples in the middle that are similar. And there's a group of samples at the bottom that are more similar to one another than they are to the other samples. Okay, so this is a numerical independent way of assessing the response of pollen and hence vegetation uh, as compared to our interpretation of the charcoal and other data implying that there was a fire. And what we see then when we do this dendrogram is that we have pre-fire samples, we have a fire impact zone, and we have post-fire samples. And this fire impact zone uh, lasted for about 130 years as uh, recorded in the pollen. And so what types of changes were we seeing? So here's the fire impact zone, pre-fire, fire impact, post-fire. These box and whistler parts are comparing median values. And what we see, for example, is Suga heterophylla, western hemlock, a fire-sensitive species, thin bark, shallow roots. You can see that as expected, you know, it, it's sitting here, the fire hits, it decreases in abundance statistically, and then it starts to increase and recover. Pinus contorta, uh, of course, it would have been knocked out in the fire, but it's early cereal species, so it increases in that fire zone, or alternatively, it's the regional pollen rain, and following that either, you know, uh, cereal pulse or uh, when the landscape was just a little bit more open in the burned area and you get the regional rain, it starts to, to decrease in abundance as the other species are, are increasing. So we did the same type of analysis. So here's our interpreted uh, fire event based on all those fire indicators. Here are our inorganic elements. This is the inferred fire. Here's our dendrogram. It's showing us that we have a fire impact zone as recorded in the inorganic elements that lines up well with our interpreted fire event. We have pre-fire uh, inorganic elements, post-fire elements. And, the, and, and sorry, I should just say here, um, the length of this zone was about 100 years. The pollen was 130. This was about 100 years. And so what do we see? When, we'll, when we look at sort of changes of specific things, we see magnesium, for example, a, a common constituent of ash, together with calcium, potassium, magnesium, or, or, or manganese, um, sodium, they all increased in abundance uh, associated with that fire horizon. And we think that's probably post-fire erosion of the ash before coming down in the post-fire environment. Elements of concern like chromium, which can have health impacts, it too increased in abundance associated with that fire before starting to trend back towards uh, baseline conditions. Other elements decrease. So, you know, uh, carbon, which is a major constituent of biomass. We removed a lot of the biomass in this fire and our input in carbon decreased. And sulfur, which is associated with organic matter, it too decreased. We did the same for diatoms. So diatoms are interesting. They're, they're photosynthetic algae. And so, but what's unique about them is they live and produce these small siliceous shells and they're called frustules. And when they die, they sink to the bottom and they accumulate much like pollen. And then we can collect the core, we can extract them, we can reconstruct them to look at how aquatic diatom communities have changed through time. And so we did that. So here's our inferred fire event. Here are our fire proxies. 
We do our dendrogram to independently assess how the diatoms responded to this fire event. And you can see we have this cluster of samples where these diatoms are more similar than they are to these diatoms or these diatoms. So we identify these zones. We have our fire impact zone. And basically what you can see is the diatoms had a fire impact zone that lasted about 150 years uh, before starting to sort of trend back to pre-fire conditions. And just to sort of illustrate that here with these box and whisker plots, um, we looked at the planktonic benthic. So the planktonic are the free floating diatoms. The benthic are ones that are sort of bound to the substrate at the bottom of the lake. And what you can see in that fire event is that the planktonic benthic ratio increased. And that's interesting because we're using this ratio as a measure of turbidity. And so you can imagine as the water became more murky that the, 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 the diatoms at the bottom of the lake would have less sort of photosynthetic capacity and they would die. The plankton that were floating in the water column, of course, would receive some sunlight and they would still persist. And if that's the case, you'd expect under murky water conditions for this ratio to skew positive. And indeed it does, statistically significant change. Uh, before starting to rebound to pre-fire conditions. And likewise, diatom, overall diatom diversity changed, probably in response to nutrient loading. So what were our key findings with this work? Well, we were able to inform the water purveyors that embedded in the sediment, we see uh, evidence of fire. And if if we're seeing evidence of fire in the sediment, it tells us that whatever was going on reflects changes that were actually occurring within the water column, okay? We, we, we were able to identify and work on five fire events. They all showed terrestrial and aquatic impacts. Um, many of them showed uh, evidence of increased erosion, including increasing turbidity as evidenced by that uh, uh, planktonic benthic ratio and changes in algal communities. We see that various elements changed across the fire event. Um, now, not all fires were high severity fires like the one I just showed you. Some were lower severity and the responses were more mooted and a little bit more challenging to interpret, but nonetheless, uh, they were there. Uh, and basically what we were able to tell the CRD is that according to our age depth model, you know, these impacts were lasting for decades, um, you know, and so the, it, you want to safeguard those impacts in terms of water quality. So it requires a number of things, which, which we made recommendations to them for, some of which they were already doing. So, and, and the last two slides here, I hope my time's okay. Um, I was invited a number of years ago, these, this is pretty exciting stuff too, to work on a fossil rich site on Ellesmere Island. And you might be thinking to yourself, why on earth are you working on Ellesmere Island in terms of fire? Well, the Ellesmere Island site that I was working on is a site called Beaver Pond, and it it was in existence, um, or it's dated to sort of the Pliocene. So the Pliocene is five million to two and a half million years ago. It's a fossil rich site. There's vertebrae fossils of bear, deer, rabbits, beaver, insects, mollusks, plant fossils. So here's a larch cone embedded in the peat sequence. Um, and I was asked to come on and do the pollen and charcoal work. Now, you know, if, if given that modern CO2 is about 420 parts per million, and the summer temperature at Eureka, which is a little hamlet on Ellesmere Island, is about four degrees, we, uh, people have previously reconstructed the CO2 in the Pliocene and based on stomatal leaf density and a whole bunch of other sort of chemical isotopic approaches. And, and what they've been able to show is in the Pliocene, CO2 was about 400 to 450 million years. So you have to go back two and a half to five million years ago to find an interval in Earth history when CO2 was comparable to today at 420. Okay, so that's the first thing. So what did we find? Well, we analyzed our core for a whole bunch of proxies. So it was dated via thermal luminescence dating. It was analyzed for these bacteria membrane uh, lipids, uh, which are very sensitive to changes in temperature. And you can use these membrane lipids to reconstruct temperature through time. It's an emerging field, very exciting. And I was doing sort of the classic pollen and charcoal. And so what the membrane lipid analyses, which was done in the Netherlands suggested is that the mean summer temperature was about 15 degrees in the past when CO2 was in the range of four to 450. Today, it's four degrees at 420. But CO2, of course, has increased dramatically in relatively short order. So do we have another 
11 degrees of summer warming baked in just because we're sitting at 420 today. Uh, when I did the analyses, I mean, this is an area today that is Arctic tundra, open barren. Well, in the past, when temperatures were 15 degrees in the summer, the pollen tells us that it was boreal forest. So here's some of the pollen I pulled out of the sequence. Pine pollen, spruce pollen, larch pollen, birch pollen, alder pollen. These are a little harder to see, but willow pollen, a sweet gale, mirica pollen, blueberry pollen, fireweed epilobium pollen, and sage pollen. And you can see that the charcoal counts were high. In fact, I was seeing some of the highest counts I've ever seen in my life in this one part of the section. And so uh, just a, a really interesting period of time. You know, we with paleo, we can go into past periods that were warmer and drier and use those as potential analogs uh, for what future conditions may hold. The Pliocene is also an important period to study because it's a time in the past when CO2 was similar to today. So we should work on trying to understand Pliocene dynamics a little bit better. And, and that's it. Um, you're welcome to email me if you have any questions or if you're in around Kamloops and would like to try and come out. These are just, you know, for paleo stuff where you can find some sources and then thanks to a whole bunch of people. That's great. Thank you, Kendrick. What an interesting presentation where you've taken us back in time and really made us think about fires that happened a long time ago and what those fires could have on terms of their impacts on the landscape for the ecosystems and even bringing us right forward into how those impacts on the ecosystems can be used to guide management um, today. And so really interesting connecting those long-term insights uh, right up to today. So we do have some time for questions. So um, again, thank you, Kendrick, for your presentation. Um, and there are some questions have popped up in the chat. So um, we'll start with the first one. Um, and the first one, it's directed to you, Kendrick. Uh, which period would Lake O'Connell have occurred? The lake would have created the Mackenzie River, Great Slave Lake, and Great Bear Lake. Oh, I don't know Lake O'Connell, but I, I guess what I would... You can still see me and everything, right, Jill? Yep, you yeah. can. What I, what I would suggest, I mean, you know, we can... I, I don't know where Lake O'Connell is located, but I guess... You know, what you could do is you could get that Dyke 2005 paper, and he has a series of snapshots of, of you know, sort of the deglacial history. And, um, you know, a lot of lakes in Canada, of course, emerge after the ice leaves. So much of the Canadian record of lakes sort of is from 15,000 years ago up until present, whereas some of the lakes in the United States, for example, which wasn't glaciated, you know, some of those lake records are going back 100,000 years. And so you can look at that, you can find sort of the location of Lake O'Connell, you can look at those maps and essentially, you know, when it becomes ice free, you know, that lake is going to form either at that time or very close to that time. So without knowing sort of the location of the lake, it, it, it's hard to answer, but that would be the way I would do it. Um, it's just to see when it became, when that area became void of ice. Okay. Thanks, Kendrick. The next question I share as well, um, how do you determine the age of each slice of the core? I mean, you talked about two millimeter resolution, which was in the, your core is equivalent to maybe about four years of time. So how do you get age control um, on your yeah. long sediment cores? Yeah. So the thing you do is you, for the top, you can lead 210 date for, but elsewhere you collect macrofossils. So needles, own little, you know, I don't know, brack fragments or, or some, you know, a seed, seeds or something, and you can submit those for radiocarbon dating. And basically, the way radiocarbon dating works is that atmos the atmosphere is being bombarded with cosmic rays continuously, and those cosmic rays interact with atmospheric nitrogen, and they convert radiocarbon fourteen, which is an isotope of carbon. And that radiocarbon-14 then combines with oxygen in the atmosphere to form radiocarbon CO2. That radiocarbon CO2 is then photosynthesized into plants. Animals come along and eat the plants, and then other animals come along and eat the animals that ate the plants as well as the plants. And so every living thing is in equilibrium with atmospheric CO2, including us, everyone on this call. We all have radiocarbon-14 in us. Radiocarbon-14 has a half-life of 5,700 years. When we all die, 
radioactive decay is going to begin in us. In 5,700 years, your remains will have half the amount of radiocarbon that, that, that they do today. In 11,400 years, they will have a quarter of the amount. So basically, you know, we date these ancient needles or seeds, which were in equilibrium at the time, and we can get an age. We then convert that age into calendar years. And so basically what you then have are a number of points that you can fit a curve to, and that becomes your millennial age model. You know, some people would argue all age models are wrong because the more dates you have, basically the more accurate they become. But, you know, in some ways, like two dates, it's the easiest, right? Because you have a linear curve that you're fitting. But when you have more dates, sometimes there's inversions and other things. So it becomes more complicated, but you develop these age depth models. And then you can say, okay, our core is 10 meters long and it spans 15,000 years. And so you can say, okay, um, you know, what's the average age sort of of these samples. And so for the, the work we were doing in the watershed, you know, those ages were based on the millennial age model. So we were just extrapolating down. The, the problem with it is that post fire, you know, one assumption you're making when you're doing that work is that the sedimentation rate doesn't change, but we know it does probably change because you have enhanced erosion. So it's not, you know, the, the millennial model isn't probably perfect, but it's the best we can do. But yeah, I mean, in general, the finer your sediment slice, the less time it's going to represent. And so we use radiocarbon dating to, to try and ascertain that we fit a curve to it, and then you can extrapolate um, ages based on that curve. Okay, that's great. Thanks for that. Um, we have a, a few more questions here that I think we can probably get through before our time's up. Um, the next question comes says, can you please comment on fire causes? And this is directed to Kendrick, um, for example, lightning versus human caused. So. Oh yeah, that's a excellent question. Um, they are difficult to differentiate. Uh, I think, you know, to look at human caused fires and, and I do see evidence of what I think are human fires in several of my records, but I don't say that lightly, you know, you, you, you look at other evidence. So you say, okay, you know, what's the archeological record telling us about human activity in this region at that time? You know, is there evidence Hi there. Um, it seems that Kendrick and Jill have both lost connectivity. Not sure what the chances of that are. Um, we'll give them about a minute to see if they can reconnect. And oh, I see Jill back. <laughs> but Kendrick is still frozen. Um, Jill, okay. That's okay. Um, so what we could do now is, thanks, Karen. <laughs> um, I think, uh, yeah, so Kendrick, if you're able to come back in, there is another question for you that we might be able to tackle just before your the time's up. Um, and hope folks can hear me now. But I think that um, we do have, uh, if anybody has a question for Trisha, I believe Trisha's still online, feel free to pop that into the chat window. Um, oh, we do have a question here for Trisha. Um, I was intrigued by your slide showing the late wood in blue. Uh, what do you think the late wood, why do you think the late wood is a better indicator of climactic changes than total ring width? So Trisha, um, what do you think about that? Are you still there, Trisha? I am. Um, um, just recent research just shows um, it's a better indicator for um, climate. Um, it's a smaller I mean, trees grow really fast at the beginning with the the big um, ring, big cells at the beginning of the year, and then they slowly produce this smaller portion of the, the late wood. Um, but uh, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I haven't, uh, I mean, it, it shows a smaller part of the season, but... Uh, when yeah i actually don't know why it's such a great a better indicator to tell you the truth i just uh, all the literature says it is it is it is and it seems to match up better with the climate records than a full ring width so when we test 
the late wood measurement against climate records, it shows a higher correlation than a full ring, ring width, but I don't know why it does. They just match up much better. I do know that using blue intensity as a tree ring parameter to correlate to climate is an emergent approach and we're still um, th thinking through things and figuring those things out. I do know, and I'll just add to, to what Tricia said that um, we do see uh, blue intensity as being potentially a better predictor of climate when you're considering trees that are more temperature limited as opposed to drought limited. Um, and then also on top of that, I mean, just anecdotally, I'm working with a student right now that's really looking at tree growth responses in 2021 and 2022. And we are seeing um, a much greater response in the amount of late wood that's produced in those very hot, dry years as a compared to the, uh, the years that didn't have as much hot, dry conditions or these pulses of drought events in the summertime. So um, maybe it has a little bit to do with the physiology of the tree when it's putting on its late wood um, and how that may be related to the target climate parameter a little bit more closely. Um, so with that in mind, um, I do see that it's 9.59. Um, so I would like to uh, close our workshop today. Um, I hope folks found uh, something interesting and new that they learned today. Um, I would like to invite both Trisha and Kendrick to put their email addresses into the chat if they're interested, so that if there are some other questions, and Kendrick and Trisha, I think there are a few other questions in there we didn't get to, perhaps you could follow up with folks. Um, so an opportunity today to learn a little bit more about the historical relationships between climate variability and wildfire. Of course, there's a lot more in the realm of understanding past wildfire that we haven't been able to look at in the workshop today, humans being obviously a very important an integral part of the relationship between past wildfire and climate. So thanks everyone. Um, we'll see you around and uh, we'll see you here next week for the, the third workshop of the February, February flare up. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.